In this video, we're going to be taking a look at producer theory. So producer theory, typically this falls a little bit later on, but it actually ties in nicely with our previous discussion on trade. Keep in mind with our discussion on trade, one of our big things we were looking at was willingness to accept. And that is how much our producer, our exporter was going to make and the price that they ultimately accepted for that. Now we saw this all in terms of opportunity cost. This case, we're gonna to start to switch to think about it in dollars. Keep in mind our opportunity cost is still gonna be there. It'll still be there and we'll still talk about it quite a bit. Big reason why this ties in, well, we're kinda of gonna go beyond that basic assumption of a linear production possibility frontier and we're gonna think about it in that convex way. That is, we're not gonna to go to that full extreme of producing entirely 100% that thing we're good at, we're going to just go most of the way there and we'll see in this building up of our producer theory how exactly that happens, how our producer, our exporter, decides how much to produce and then we're going to similarly work out how they determine a price for their good. Today in this video all we're going to be taking a look at is the basic definitions, the basic concepts, um, assumptions of our producer in the next video, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of building up the model. Keep in mind, this is probably one of the most difficult models in micro. In this way here, we're gonna get it out of the way. We're gonna deal with it right up front so that we have a good foundation. We have a good basis of these fundamentals for when we move on to some of the easier models as we carry on with the course. Without further ado, let's uh, take a look at our basic assumptions for producer theory. So the first thing we have to ask in uh, respect to producer theory is, okay, we're talking about producers, we're talking about businesses. Why are people in business? If we think about something like a coffee shop, why is the coffee shop owner running the coffee shop business? Is it purely just because they love coffee? Is the baker in the bakery business just because they love baking? Well, to a degree, they probably do have a passion for it, but more importantly than that, they're not just doing baking, they're not just making coffee out of the goodness of their own hearts. Rather, our fundamental assumption, our fundamental assumption that underpins all of producer theory is that our firms, right, our firms, let's write this down here, our fundamental assumption is that firms aim, they exist, aim to maximize their profit. This is their sole reason for being in business is to maximize their profit, to get the highest level of profit they possibly can. Now, okay, in this sense here, common answers to this question ultimately tend to be, well, why are firms in business? Well, to make money, to earn revenue, these kind of things. No, that's not enough. That's not enough. It turns out in explaining the world around us and looking at businesses and the way that firms react, maximizing profit, this whole profit maximization best explains firm behavior and is able to best utilize, or rather the way that we can best utilize our models in order to explain that. So the question from that then is, well, what is profit? Well, in a simple way, many of you might be in accounting, many of you might be in other business senses, and you know, yeah, okay, I know what profit is. Really, what we're going to look at is we're going to make a little shorthand notation for this, and we're going to call profit, we're going to denote that as pi. So the Greek letter pi, that's, that's going to be our profit. That's what we're going to denote it as. And we're going to say that pi, profit, is going to be equal to our total revenues. So all the money we make, TR, total revenue, minus our costs, or in this case here, total costs. We'll open this up. It turns out we'll have a whole bunch of costs to consider. And so total costs would be all of those costs added together. So as we move in through this chapter, as we get into the second bit of the, rather the second video, we'll be taking a look at this total revenue versus total cost aspect in a lot more detail and work it out from there. Let's uh, carry on though with this whole bit here. We said, okay, big thing of firms is that they aim to maximize profit. 
If we recall back, one of our principles of economic is that agents act in the margin. And same thing here. And again, it's not going to mean much right now, but it will mean a lot more when we get into this model, is that firms aim to maximize profit and they will maximize their profit in the margin. Right? And don't get too caught up on that right now. This is just part of our definition. You're like, I don't know what that means. That's fine. We'll see what this means as we carry on. So what do we have so far? Basic assumption. Firms aim to maximize profit and they'll do so in the margin. Profit itself is total revenue minus total cost. And you're probably like, okay, Keith, I'm sick of this. You've said this maximize profit at least five times now. Look, I just said it again. Yes, I have because it's fundamental to everything we're going to be doing carrying forward. And it's the concept that's most commonly missed, right? Without, without fail, I'll ask this question, why do firms exist? What is the fundamental assumption for firm behavior? And people tell me to make money. No, right? Fundamental assumption, fundamental reason why firms exist is to maximize their profit. So something to keep in mind with that. When talking about firms, we are going to deal with three different time periods. And these three different time periods are the short run. We'll abbreviate that as just SR for short, short run. We're going to have the long run, so LR for long run. And then very finally, we're going to have the very long run. So three distinct time periods. And I refer to these as time periods, but in reality, there's no time actually associated with these. What we'll do is we'll take a look at what's happening in each of these time periods, and then that will help us to see the distinction from each one. Uh, as we go through, though, this short run, this will be primarily our focus in micro. Uh, probably about 99% of our conversation, 99% of our modeling will occur in the short run. So this will be where we spend the majority of our time. We'll venture into the long run. We'll venture into the very long run just to kind of see what's going on here. But this would be the area of focus for farther study, for farther courses. So short run, long run, very long run. We have three factors to consider. Our three factors are going to be labor. So our workers, right? How many people we have, how many employees we have working for us. We're going to have... K, this is our capital. So these are our machines, our equipment, all of the tools, the factories, um, our shop itself. All of that is our capital. That there's going to be our other, our other factor of production. So these two here are our factors of production. And then finally, we're going to have technology. So we're going to have labor, our workers, K, our capital, and T, our technology, such that technology is really going to be getting at how effectively we can use this labor and capital to make a unit of output. So in our short run, the short run is defined by having our labor being varied. So we can hire, we can fire, we can change our staffing levels. So our labor can be varied entirely in the short run. But both our capital and our technology are fixed. So a big defining feature in the short run is, of course, going to be our fixed capital. So that is, we can't just go out and buy new equipment. We can't just go out and buy a new factory, right? This here cannot occur in our day-to-day -day operations, in these short run operations. The only thing we can influence today in the short run is our labor. If we carry on then to our long run, well, again, we're going to have our labor. Again, we're going to have our capital. And again, we're going to have technology. In the long run, well, we can now choose our labor and capital. Both of these can be varied. So we can find the perfect match, the perfect ratio between the amount of workers we need and the amount of capital that we want. And this can be perfectly matched in order to, well, in order to 
maximize our profit because keep in mind again that's our big assumption but in this long run time period our technology is still fixed we are still stuck with whatever our technological level is it's not until we get to our very long run well okay we're gonna have labor capital and technology in this very long run now finally can we choose all of our uh, factors of production and technology all of these can be varied to overcome any problem so we can change our level of labor we can change the capital amounts we have so how many factories how much equipment how many tools all of this and we can also create new technologies to overcome problems so in this very long run time period labor capital and tech can all be varied so big big kind of summary of this short run labor is chosen capital and tech is given to us it is fixed in the long run labor and capital is chosen but technology is fixed finally in the very long run in the very long run everything can be chosen in order to overcome any problem we face so our three time periods we say that with time period and then people go oh, okay well how long is the short run how long is the long run is the short run uh, maybe days is the short run weeks uh, maybe it's months um, the true answer to this question in good economic nature the answer to this question is it depends it really depends on the industry we're talking about some industries they can change their capital stock relatively easily because well their capital is relatively cheap and easy to acquire buy or to liquidate and sell other industries this is very difficult difficult imagine um large shipping industries so using those massive super tankers to sail across the pacific ocean right that one piece of capital that one ship is very difficult to obtain big cost associated with it big production of it it's not just oh yeah we want to buy one next day we have it and very similarly if we want to get rid of them if we find we have too much capital well it's going to be pretty hard to find a buyer it's going to be difficult to liquidate that capital so all that to say what is the time frame of the short run we really can't say right we can't point and say okay so many days is the short run the short run is entirely the amount of time when capital cannot be changed and that varies by industry to industry so rather subjective but this is where we'll be spending our time at least as i said 95 percent of our time as we carry on through the course let's carry on our conversation then taking a look specifically at this short run time period so taking a look at this short run time period let's just keep scrolling down we said in the short run we have our choice of labor but we have fixed capital and we know technology is fixed we're just going to ignore that for the time being it's just going to be something that's just hanging around with us but labor and capital are two factors of production these are going to be the two big things that we're going to look at and since i wrote fixed in front of capital let's write varied in front of labor so what we have to realize is that as we use this labor, as we use this capital in our production process, we're going to have costs, right? We're going to have costs of labor and we're going to have capital costs as well. Well, what we should notice with this then is that, well, if our capital is fixed, well, then these costs are going to be fixed as well. That is, it doesn't matter if I produce one unit, a hundred units, a thousand units, or if I produce zero units, I still have the same cost of this capital. Maybe that cost is the loan for your factory. Maybe that uh, cost is just the loan for all your tools and equipment that you got out, right? In this case here, this fixed capital cost is just there irrespective of the amount of units I end up producing. On the other hand though, with my labor, well, with my labor, I'm going to have, I'm going to have wage costs. 
right? I'm going to have wage costs in the fact that if I want to produce more stuff, I'm going to need to hire more people. If I hire more people, I'm going to have to pay more out in wages, not necessarily that I have to pay them a higher hourly wage, but more people means more labor costs altogether. So I have fixed costs for capital and varied costs for labor, such that my labor costs are my wage costs. Now, especially for those of you in accounting, you're like, yeah, okay, this makes sense. This is pretty clear. We would refer to all of this as our explicit costs. Explicit costs. That is the actual cost of these workers, the actual cost of this capital. These are found on balance sheets, on income statements. This is what accountants are here for, right? This is what accountants are figuring out for us. One of the big things that we're going to be looking at is going to be a little bit different. We're still interested in these explicit costs. They're still relevant for us, but we're really going to be interested in what we're going to call implicit costs. And implicit costs, these are the opportunity costs of our choices, the opportunity costs of what we have decided to have for labor or what we've decided to have for capital. And let's take a look at how these work themselves in. Let's start off with the opportunity cost of labor. And let's, let's just imagine a very, very small firm, right? So a very small firm where you are the owner, you're the operator, and you're the only one working, right? You're the only employee. So we have you, and you have two choices. Let's say that you are in the business of carpentry, and you make chairs. So your two choices here as to what you could do with your labor is you could have your own business or you could work for somebody else um, I'm gonna go work for firm work for another firm right this is you have scarce resource of your time given the scarce resource of your time you have a choice between working for somebody else working for their firm or to own your own business well because of this choice, you have a trade-off, you have an opportunity cost of whichever one you've given up. So let's suppose that working for the firm, you're able to bring in, I don't know, let's say you can bring in $2,000 a paycheck. So you're pretty happy with that, it's working well, but you're hoping that, hey, if I start my own business, maybe I can do better. Well, okay, maybe eventually you can do better, but let's imagine you're just starting this business up, right? You're wanting this business to succeed. You have high hopes for it as we move on into the future. As a result, what you're doing is you are reinvesting. You're keeping most of your earnings in the business and you're paying yourself, you're paying your labor costs very, very little because you want to see this business succeed, right? This is a common thing for a startup to do. You'll give yourself very little money from the business, just what you need to survive and reinvest the rest so that this business is hopefully successful. So in this case, let's say that you are only able to pull out safely $1,500 a paycheck from this business, right? The rest, maybe you're earning more, but it's going back into the business to ensure its success. Well, you see here now that you have a trade-off, you have a choice between these two amounts. That is, if you chose to work for the firm, you earn 2,000, where if you start your own business, you only get 1,500. In this case here, we would say that the opportunity cost of starting your own business would be this $500 lost, right? This $500 that you could have earned if you had worked for somebody else. So believe it or not, in economics, we would count this as an implicit cost of running the business. The fact that your labor could have been better utilized, earned a higher return for somebody else's business than it could have for your own. And in this way, we would include these implicit costs in that total cost calculation when we're trying to determine profit. 
Very similarly, we have our other cost, we have capital. Right, we have our capital. Keith, isn't capital spelt with a C? Yes, yes, capital is spelt with a C. But in order to keep the notation that, hey, K is what we're using to denote capital, I'm writing it here with a K just to really drive that home. So let's go back to this whole, you have your business, you're a carpenter, you're making chairs, you have your two options. You can have your own business or you can work for a firm. Very similarly, let's say you have your startup capital. Let's say that you have $100,000 sitting around as cash and you have a decision to make, right? Your scarce resource is how much you have there. And you're going to have a choice to be, okay, do I take this 100000 and do I invest in yourself, in your own business, or do you invest in somebody else's business, in others' business, right? Maybe this is just going to the market and buying stocks, buying shares in another business altogether, giving them your money and getting a return on it. Well, again, let's just kind of take a look at this scenario, initial startup. Let's suppose that off the start, if you were to invest in the market, you could get a pretty good, let's say 10% return. And big thing, right? We're not going to get into the finance of it or anything like that. But there is an implicit assumption here that this would be an equivalent risked business as the risk of you starting your own business, right? So we'd have a adjusted for risk return between these two. So let's say that if you invest in yourself, this 100,000, right, you're buying capital with this 100,000, you're buying your tools, your equipment, your shop perhaps. Well, this 100,000 invested in yourself, you think you're gonna be earning some profit off of your business, and let's say that that translates into an 8% per year return. So, okay, if we work that out, what do we end up getting? That would be, $10,000 return if you put your money into the market, into somebody else's business, or if you put it into your own business, you'd be getting an $8,000 return. That is, again, in our scenario here, by starting your own business, you have an opportunity cost, opportunity cost of your capital in this case, of $2,000, right? You've given up you lost $2,000 by starting your own business, using this money on yourself, rather than using this money on somebody else. Again, from an economic standpoint, the reason why both of these are of interest to us, we're interested in the use of scarce resources, and we're interested in the efficient use of scarce resources. In these cases, on the left, we are getting lower returns, that means that we were not able to use these resources as efficiently as the option on the right, and thus we have our higher costs. And so we would want to account for those higher costs in our analysis. So we would include both of these implicit costs into our cost calculation. Big thing to keep in mind though, this can also go the other way. Let's, let's just take a quick backup here. Let's go and that was our labor, this is our capital. Let's take a look at another scenario. Let's say you start your own business. We'll go back up to taking a look at labor to start here. We have this 2,000 working for a firm. And let's say that initially, right, same plan. You're like, I'm only gonna pay myself a little bit. I'm gonna reinvest a lot of it back into the business so that it really is successful. But you start your own business and wow, business is better than you ever thought it could be. And as a result of this, well, you're actually able to take home 3,000 a paycheck and still leave plenty in retained earnings for your business. So you're like bringing home tons of money and you're still, you're, you're, you're laughing. Business is great. Well, in this case, if you chose to run your own business, well, in this case, you actually have an opportunity cost of, you could have had 2,000, or you could have run your own business, we have an opportunity cost of negative 1,000, right? What, negative 1,000 cost? Uh, what's, what's happening here? 
Well, what's happening here is we have a negative cost, a negative cost, right? That's essentially a double negative. This is a benefit, right? This is saying that this was such a good decision over this one that you're up, right? You are up in terms of this benefit being had. So we would want to include this as a negative implicit cost, and we would add this in this case here in our profit scenario. Very similarly going down to capital, we could look at the same kind of idea. We could say that, yep, you expect to get 10% from the market. Or again, you get in, you're starting your business, and your business turns out to be so insanely, um, so insanely successful that you're able to pull out a 15% return. So, right, that's going to be 15,000. Well, again... In this case here, if that worked out, you would have your opportunity cost of negative 5,000. Again, a negative cost is going to be viewed as a benefit. Yes, you've won again, right? So again, we would include this as a benefit in our profit calculation. And on that note, let's go and take a look at that profit calculation again. So how do we define profit? We said that profit, so keep in mind this little pi here, right, Greek letter pi, we'll use this to denote profit. And we're going to say that profit is equal to total revenue minus total costs. Total revenue in a very simple world, say we just sell one good wooden chairs. Well, our total revenue is just going to be the price that we can sell those wooden chairs for times the quantity of wooden chairs that I can sell. So price times quantity, that is my total revenue. My total cost, this is where things are going to get a little bit fun. My total cost in a very simple set sense is going to be my explicit costs. So my explicit costs, again, we talked about those way up top here. Let's go take a look at them again. We talked about our explicit costs, right? For our labor, this was our wage costs. For our capital, it was the cost, the physical cost of the capital. These here, these explicit costs, these can also be thought of as our accounting costs. Accounting costs. So we can also think about it in that sense there. If we were to calculate our profit as just simply total revenue minus our total costs being just explicit costs, we would say that this is our accounting profit. Accounting, oh, accounting profit. And this would be our accounting profit because this is profit as accountants measure it. This is, right, when you take a look at what the profitability of a certain firm, of a certain company is, this is the profit that's reported, the accounting profit. So, okay, you found out, hey, Apple earned X many billion dollars in profit this year. That was their accounting profit. What we're interested in, we're actually not interested in accounting profit. We're in economics, so we're going to be interested in profit which will be total revenue, that's still same idea, price times quantity, so again, how many chairs we were able to sell and the price per chair, minus our total costs. Nope, that's not a C. Let's try that again. Total costs. And these total costs, these are going to be our explicit costs, Right? So these are the accounting costs, but we're also going to want to include our implicit costs, the opportunity costs of our choices. And it turns out this economic profit, right? It's like, well, why? Why do we need to include all these opportunity costs? Because this economic profit turns out to be a better signal to for firm behavior and a better signal as to what's happening in the marketplace around us. So it's this economic profit. Let's, let's write that down. This guy here is 
economic profit. And this guy is the one that we're talking about. When we're talking about profit in economics, we are referring to economic profit, not accounting profit. This is really not going to be of interest to us. Economic profit is the big takeaway. And let's take a look at really the distinction between distinction between the two here. Let's suppose we have a scenario. Let's suppose that we have a firm and this given firm they have a total revenue of $50 billion and they have total accounting costs. So I'm going to go total costs subscript A for this is just their accounting costs of $40 billion. So if we were to work out this firm's profit, right? We could work out their, again, this is going to be their accounting profit. We could work out, I'll subscript that A again because this is accounting profit. We could work this out to be 50 minus 40. So we have accounting profit of $10 billion. Yay, they're doing quite well, right? They're earning a ton of money. But let's add on to this. Let's add on to this another scenario. Let's suppose that this firm has explicit, or sorry, not explicit, has implicit costs. Let's suppose they have implicit costs of, well, to start off, let's say of five billion. So this is their opportunity cost, right? Maybe their labor was gonna be able to earn more somewhere else. Maybe their capital was going to get a better return if it was used somewhere else, right? This was the opportunity cost of choosing to use the labor, choosing to use the capital where they had versus that next best alternative that was better. Well, in this case, we can work out our profit as still the same revenue, still have 50 billion worth of revenue. Now our total costs, well, we're still going to have our explicit cost of 40, we now want to also include in this implicit cost, so 40 plus 5, and we can get our economic profit. And what? That's going to be 50 minus 45. We would have an economic profit of 5 billion. So in this case, we had positive accounting, we had positive economic profit. Okay, seems to be a link between these two. But it turns out that might just be coincidence. We can have another case going on here. Let's just move over. Let's say instead, instead let's say that we had an implicit cost of 10 billion. So, okay, if we had this 10 billion implicit cost, we have revenue of 50 minus our explicit of 40 and then add in our implicit of 10. Oh, we're going to have economic profit of zero, meaning they're turning a really nice accounting profit, but from an economic sense, they're actually earning no profit at all. That is the cost that's not being counted in the accounting side. All of those trade-offs, that opportunity cost is so great that it's actually negating all of the profit that they're earning. We could have a final scenario. We could have a final scenario. Let's take a look at a case where we have an implicit cost. Oh, what happened there? Well, let's get rid of that. Uh, we, are, we have an implicit cost of... And you're probably seeing where this is going. An implicit cost of 15 billion. Well, working this through, okay, same total revenue of 50, same explicit cost of 40, and then throw on that 15. Well, what do we have now? We have 50 minus 55. We now have economic profit of negative, negative 5 billion, right? So, okay, what, what's really the point of all of this? What are we getting at in these three examples? Are we just trying to kill time? No, 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 that'd just be a waste, right? 
what we're taking a look at is that really, yes, we can take a look at what the accounting profit of a firm is. These are reported for all publicly traded firms. It's quite easy to find what their accounting profit is. But what it turns out is that just because we know their accounting profit does not mean that we can actually discern what their economic profit is. Because to figure out this economic profit, we need to know what the opportunity costs are. And these opportunity costs would require a bit more analysis in order to be able to figure out. And so we can have a firm that's accountingly profitable, but in an economic sense, actually earning negative profit. And that's the big takeaway to have, especially as we carry on through this course, we're going to be taking a look at a lot of cases of firms being at zero profit. And the question always comes up, how does that make sense? How does it make sense for a firm to continually operate with zero profit? Well, okay, zero economic profit. They may be earning quite large accounting profit, but they're earning zero economic profit. And then same thing when we have negative profit as well. So hopefully that distinction is clear through that. And we'll take a look at this economic profit and the determination of it in a lot more detail in our next videos. In those next videos, what are we going to be taking a look at? We'll start getting into the nitty gritty of building our model. We'll take a look at this idea of productivity, uh, how much different factors of production can produce and the trade-offs between those. And then we'll take a look at our costs and how our costs and thus profits change as we change our production decision. If you have any questions with this though, our basic introduction of the concepts and assumptions, the fundamentals of our producer theory, please drop me a line, email, frequently asked questions on D2L, and we can get them sorted out. As a brief summary, big, big ideas. Biggest idea through this whole bit is the existence of a firm. Firms aim, they exist to maximize profit. So that's your big takeaway. Second one is our profit equation itself. Profit is total revenue minus total cost. And with that, that we are primarily dealing with the short run. And the short run such that labor is chosen, capital and technology is fixed or dictated to us. Final distinction to be made is the distinction between accounting and economic profit. So a few big takeaways from this. Again, any last questions, feel free to reach out.